people who complain about the weather up north, I always like to remind them that it's the land where the rainbows live. Welcome back to Piano Book. If you're new to Piano Book, don't know what it's all about, I've linked above a kind of prologue to the whole project. The first thing I want to address is the most common question raised in uh, the comments beneath last week's show. But to answer that question effectively, we need to do some COD science. So let's head back to the shed. I've got a few little kind of COD science experiments to show you that's all come from this kind of grand dawning I had during a meal at a Japanese restaurant. More of that later. If you recall last week, linked above, we recorded this shimmel, felt off in a series of 12 samples. So we did one round of 12 samples, quiet, one loud, and then some release triggers. We started at C0, moved up the cycle of fifths, all the way up to this F here. And many of you felt, well, surely it would be better if you were to sample more notes. That would make sense from a sampling point of view. The more detail you wrap into a sample instrument, the more realistic it'll sound. But is realism the question? For me, the problem, the enigma, is sampling pianos. They're right little blighters. But what I'm troubled by is why the samples we made last week actually sound better than this piano. With the felt down, this piano sounds awesome. It's, it's why I bought it, as an example. It's a wonderful Celeste-like quality. You pick the pedal up, Now, does that sound more realistic? Well, I would say not, but do you prefer the sound of that to the live piano? It's an interesting question. There's something a little bit more pure about the tone. It sounds a bit richer. Why is that? Well, I think it's because of the amount of information that you can or can't rather capture within a sample. What sampling enables us to do is to play instruments we wouldn't ordinarily be able to play. So maybe because we don't own a piano or because I don't know how to play a violin. Conversely, what sampling cannot do is recreate the infinite chaos of an instrument. Here's an example. I'm gonna sample a C. a C sharp, and both of them together. Okay, so let's listen to the strings recorded separately, the C and the C sharp. You can hear the rub, you can hear the vibration. However, what I'm hearing is actually something that's quite constant. Compare it to this. There is more of a slightly unreliable flutter. So, hear it again. Compared to this. If you're still having difficulty hearing it, I'm going to add masses of distortion to it. Excuse your ears. Compare the two. It really does stand out. Compared to... So exactly the same microphones, exactly the same piano, we cannot capture that complex crosstalk between the two notes. But I don't think that's just it. I think the other key element of the MVP piano and what makes it successful is the fact that pretty much everything except for the root notes are tuned down. Remember, we've gone up in fifths. Let's have a look at the MVP. And basically, if we take, for example, this G0, we start at G and go down. And this is when we return to the Japanese restaurant, where my theory kind of light bulb moment kind of hit. You know, in Japanese restaurants, sometimes you get uh, chopsticks in a, a, a paper sheath. Well, I scrunch that up and I use it as a thing to put the chopstick on the table so it doesn't stick on the table with the soy sauce and stuff. And I suddenly had a bit of a moment. Now, 
I tried to nick a pair of chopsticks, but they didn't take kindly to it uh, in this Japanese restaurant in Edinburgh. So I'm going to try and imitate it with uh, this bit of paper here. So imagine this is the, the, the thing scrunched up. What I did is I pulled it apart. And what I realised was that that kind of represents what we're doing when we're tuning stuff down within a sampler. Now, if you do it within, say, for example, time stretching, what you're actually doing is adding more fragments, more kind of information. But what happens when you pull a wave out is you're actually decreasing the amount of information. And in fact, the more you stretch it, the more your wave starts to resemble a sine wave. And we like sine waves. Here's another experiment. I'm going to do this in exactly the same way as we did the piano. So I'm going to do 12 notes, cycle of fifths, using this sustained pedal. Okay, so let's uh, have a play of that. I always find sampling instrument. I expected that to sound so much better, particularly down here. You can hear there's a lot of that stuff, a lot of information in there. So just for an experiment, let us take away the lower regions and stretch down from higher up. Fatter. If we go even further, take it all the way up to here. Now that's a pad I would use. It's more of a sine wave the lower it gets. And we like sine waves because sine waves are fat. And we all prefer fat, don't we? I have my cod theory there as well. I don't know if this is true, but they say that you get the low end of your hearing before the top end. If that isn't in fact true, it's probably safe to assert that we hear more bottom end before top when we're in utero. Anyway, what I'm getting to is, I think we're naturally drawn to sounds that have a richer, lower, bassier quality. Let's add some distortion to that basic piano pad. So just gonna hit the C. It creates an incredibly complex signal. Whereas if we just add it to a simple sine wave, it sounds like this. It forms a constant wave, which takes me back to that original point about the two notes recorded separately. There was a rub, but it was consistent because it was in the digital domain that this rub was occurring. And my personal view is this is the same for all sorts of processing, all sorts of forms of distortion and modulation, reverberation. It sounds kind of cheap and tacky, inappropriate. Let's add that to the MVP. Okay, it is duller and richer, the signal is different, but I don't know if you agree, it seems to suit it better. It seems to be less inappropriate. And I think this is where sampling and processing go hand in hand. People are asking, is the MVP just the absolute minimum of what should be provided for these raw piano samples? And my answer is, yes, that's the point of the term minimal viable product. Yes, and it's a way of framing the library. We don't want it to be, you know, 200 Hans Zimmer pianos and it would be terabytes of data. But also, I have to say, I prefer the sound and character of a slightly less detailed sampled piano. It's interesting because this ties in with another question someone uh, wrote in with, which is, you know, how about, how do you go about sampling a piano without the front off? The misconception is you take the front off, it gets brighter, as if you're miking the strings. No, the reason I do this is because I'm miking the hammers. I want to hear the piano at work. That's what the front panel does, is it kind of hides that sound. It's not the strings that we're listening to, it's this bit of wood back here, the soundboard that you're hearing. Imagine taking the body of an acoustic guitar off and just playing with the neck and the strings. The strings don't make that much noise, it's the body around them. And listen to this, if I put the sustain pedal down, the soundboard is resonating the strings. 
the strings are then resonating the soundboard. It is this interplay between the strings, the soundboard, and the different notes, the harmonies, the rubs, that simply cannot be recreated with samples. So for me, piano because afforded me a rare, revelatory, breakthrough, light bulb moment, where I've considered what sampling enables us to do. We've discussed that it enables us to play instruments we wouldn't ordinarily be able to play, for whatever reason. It also allows us to do stuff that you couldn't do in reality, in nature, to achieve the impossible, to make my voice sing down three octaves. But also, it enables us to share, share our instruments. Today, I may be able to play a piano that was played this morning in Australia. Not only that, I'm playing someone playing that piano. It's an extraordinary opportunity, and I think one that excites me about Piano Book. So here's a slightly more interesting question. I took this notion to the powers that be at Spitfire and talked to them about the Piano Book project. Now, if I wasn't clear before, I always thought that this was gonna be a Spitfire product, if you will, but made out in the open, curated by myself, with contributions from the community. And as I mentioned before, I've yet to consider what compensation I should offer those individuals from the community for their contributions. And that's where it started getting difficult for me. I've spoken to a few of you in person about help being offered towards the Piano Book Project. And the minute I started speaking to you, I became more uneasy about the commercialization of this kind of community project. So our fantastic CEO, Will Evans, who's a bit of a visionary, suggested that maybe it shouldn't be a Spitfire product. Maybe it shouldn't be a commercial product. Maybe it should just sit alone as piano book, which I'm really excited about. However, it does mean that I'm now confused as to what it should be. My personal feeling is we should make something. We should scope something and make it, even if it is volume one or chapter one. But how to package something that is a series of things that are free? Well, this is where I need to ask your advice. I'm gonna conduct a poll, maybe with some steers, just to get an idea of consensus. But I would really welcome your comments down below and I will read all of them to really get an idea. I guess my heart goes with an idea of us possibly just simply sharing everything so we can try it out, GUIs, prototypes, uh, raw pianos, morphed pianos, share all of that and share our feelings about these sounds, but then possibly curate a Best of Piano Book 2019, which we can sell on the Spitfire site, use Spitfire as a distributor maybe. So effectively, if you can't afford to buy it, you can go to Piano Book and kind of put it together yourself. But if you want the convenience of it being packaged together, boxed and ribboned, just the good stuff, you can go there and get it. And then we could maybe put the money that we earn out of that back into either Piano Book or some kind of charitable exercise. I don't know, that's where my heart kind of is. Not entirely convinced about it and I haven't asked Spitfire's permission either. Jeepers, this rainbow, I don't know if you can see this. So above is a bunch of multiple choice answers to the question, what would you prefer Piano Book to be? So I'd really appreciate your input there, but also any ideas you have, comments below. This is an amazing, kind of journey I think we're on and I spoke to one of you uh, recently who suggested maybe we organize some kind of town hall meeting in London soon uh, that could be interesting thanks as always for watching if you haven't subscribed yet there will be loads more freebies coming up alongside lots more cod science if you'd like to be notified the next time I put a video up ding that bell and one of those always appreciated for my efforts on the side rainbowy mountains see you next week bye